Welcome to Season 2 of On Listening. This is your host, Daniel Rosen. Thank you for joining us as we continue to explore listening in all its dimensions. Continue listening after the interview is over for some information about engagement with the show. Thank you. On the next episode of On Listening, I am incredibly excited to interview Michelle Zakin. She has recently graduated with her master's degree from NTID in a program that I tried to remember and I can't. So I'm going to have her tell us what that program is. What is that program? (laughs) Sure. So it's the acronym is MSSC, but it actually stands for Masters of Science in Secondary Education for students who are deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, I'm really excited about this show because this is the first episode that is being recorded so that people who are deaf and hard of hearing can listen with ASL. Yep. And I have to say, I searched to find a person who was interested in doing this and came upon Michelle. We don't have a prior relationship to this, but it's really been a joy meeting her and her earnestness and intensity around wanting to participate has just been really exciting for me. I'm very, very excited to be here today. Good. I tend to uh, uh, ask very broad questions and slowly I'm learning that more specific questions tend to guide the guest to participate in a way that, well, ideally gets towards what I'm looking for but also some guests seem to imply that it's helpful for them to know, uh, like to have a direct question. But in my mind, I also worry that asking a specific question precludes them from talking about what they want to talk about. So there's a fine balance in this of responding and with listening to towards a curiosity in an area of inquiry and also an attempt to give the guest who's the expert from their position uh, airtime. So I'll I'll start broad. (laughs) Right. ASL is a language. It's a, it's a language that, and what's happening is there's a, interpreter because we're speaking different languages but also i think that it's a visual language and you listen through your eyes can you explain what's true or not true about that so yes actually before i start answering any of your questions i also want to start by mentioning that Every deaf and hard of hearing person is different. So my experience, the answers that I'm providing to you today, they might represent people in the deaf and hard of hearing community, yes. But on the other hand, we're not all the same. So other listeners might not agree with my answers or their experiences might be different. So again, we are not a one size fits all population or community. So there's not one way to be deaf. You know, everybody has their own experience, their own upbringing, and that really guides that individual to having their own preference for communication and for approaches for that. So everything is individualized. So when I'm answering questions today, that's representing me and my experience. If that were to fit some of our listeners, that's great. I think it definitely will fit other people's experiences, but it won't fit every listener's experience today. In the broadest sense. And I wanted to just make that point now, just to make everybody aware. So people who are watching or listening, just to have it be known that, again, my answers are not going to be the end all be all to the experiences of people in deaf community. You know, I am a member of the deaf community, yes, 
but I do not represent the entire community. Again, there is a huge variety in the community and people's experiences. And so I think that's really the best part of our community is that we are extremely diverse. So again, I just wanted to mention that before I answer any of your other questions. That's exactly what I mean by being careful about asking a question. <laughs> yes, I really appreciate that. You told me a little bit about that before the show and there I am running forward towards my curiosity rather than giving you time to, to describe where you're coming from. Nope, that's totally fine. Again, I just wanted to preface that before I answer anything. Again, just because I know sometimes what will happen with smaller communities or more marginalized communities or less known communities is that people will normally kind of label or blank, do a blanket statement for the entire community and that's not entirely what happens. So again, today is more about exposure about the diversity of what really happens within the deaf and hard of hearing community. Well appreciated. One of the first things you yeah, I'm sorry. Get, to get back to the point then. Oh, uh, to go? Do you want to go? I think I'm going to build a little bit on what you just said. Oh, yeah, sure. One of the main differences that you explained to me in a phone call we had a few weeks ago was that there's a number of people who are deaf or hard of hearing who haven't learned American Sign Language, ASL. Right. Which to me was a little novel. And yeah, that really depends on how the individual was raised. It depends on what exposure they had. If their parents decided to go in, you know, which direction with their education or with their experiences. So they can either take the more medical route or the more cultural route to how they want to raise their deaf child. Those aren't the only two options, but those are the main ones that, you know, typically people follow. Thank you. I'm ready to go back to the original question, which I personally have forgotten by now, but maybe you still remember. Yeah, you're talking about ASL and that it is a full bona fide language. Tell us more how the deaf and hardened and hearing listen with ASO. Yeah, okay. Deaf people are just extremely visual. They are visual people. They take everything in through their eyes, not their ears. So ASL was created for that reason. And that's just a way that people can, you know, like the same way that hearing people can just listen, you know, just passively listen, but that kind of parallels to the deaf community and that they watch and converse instead of listening. So that's essentially what it is. It's like listening with your eyes. And so with that being said, our bodies are actually, we develop a little bit differently than hearing people. So we become more visual, visually aware of our surroundings. So for an example, let me think about that. Okay, for an example, deaf people have better peripheral vision than hearing people do. And that's an actual proven fact that that is the case. And the reason being for why they have much better peripheral vision is because they have to use their eyes more and able to, you know, take in that information. That's how we are able to access information by seeing things and observing our surroundings. And we have to figure out what is around us. Whereas hearing people, if they walk into a new environment or in a room, they can observe things visually, yes. But a deaf person, when they walk into a new room, they're only taking things in with their eyes. They don't have the benefit of having, you know, auditory supplements as well. So that is a skill that we have developed because 
that is really, that's actually one privilege for us is that we do have better, you know, peripheral vision and we do have better understanding of, you know, the visuals around us. I really appreciate that. That is really helpful information right off the bat for me. So for the deaf and hard of hearing is a lot of uh, visual clutter distracting from listening to another person. Yeah, it can be definitely. But at the same time, we also, we also learn how to filter that noise out or that auditory noise out. So again, like I mentioned with the peripheral vision, maybe if you are trying to focus on one person, maybe there's going to be two other people off to the side that you notice signing, even though I'm trying to sign with the person in front of me. So if I notice the two other people to the side, that might become distracting, but I normally do have the ability to filter that out just because I am focused on the person in front of me that I'm trying to converse with. And that's the same kind of concept that if you were to go into a coffee shop and sit with one of your friends, you can hear other people in the conver or in the background, right? You can hear the surrounding people's conversations, but you don't necessarily actively listen to them unless you want to and eavesdrop. That's something you can do, but you tend to focus on your friend or the person that you're having coffee with and that conversation that's happening directly in front of you. So again, you're able to filter things out with your ears, whereas we are able to do that with our eyes. So you don't know who you're talking to. I have a terrible time filtering out auditory signal when I'm trying to talk to somebody. If I walk into a cafe that's playing uh, what I think is kind of cool music in the background, even if it's really soft, I, my brain just goes right there. In, in ASL, you know, for hearing people to sign this sign, if you can see me signing it right now, that's to actually listen with your ears. So those two signs that I just showed means to listen for, with your ears, uh, for, deaf or hard of hearing people or people who sign, you would sign listening like that with your thumb closer to your eyes rather than your ears. So that's how it's represented in ASL. So with that, you're already able to show that the word listen, it just means to pay attention to or to try to hear the audio or listen to something. But for deaf people, that's not just about that. You know, for deaf and hard of hearing people, essentially that means to receive information or to absorb information or to understand something or to catch something. So we as deaf and hard of hearing people have a little bit of a different definition of the term to listen. I mean, at least in my opinion, but it's just based on, you know, signing and how we use it. So again, we do listen, but we just absorb our complete surroundings. So we, listen to conversations that we're having with other people or conversations that are happening around us. So yeah, we do listen. Absolutely. Of course, like you had mentioned, but it's just a different way of listening than hearing people. And then another point I want to make on that is that some deaf and hard of hearing people, they do actually listen with their ears. There is the auditory component as well. You know, some deaf people ha do have a level of hearing that they are able to pick up on auditory cues. So that doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, the help actually, let me back up for a second here. That's actually a separate part. So if 
So for a deaf person, if they listen, it's actually based on using a tool. So a cochlear implant or a hearing aid. So those are supplemental supports to, you know, listening. And that's a completely separate aspect of this whole question. So that's a whole different topic and a whole different issue that I can get into further later. But people who are deaf and hard of hearing need to learn how to listen if they have a cochlear implant or a hearing aid because with technology, it's not a natural process of listening. So it's something they have to actively learn to do. And that's how they'll acquire sound and language is if they take that time to practice. So yeah. So actual auditory listening can happen with deaf and hard of hearing people, but every deaf and hard of hearing person, they hear a different way too, which is through their eyes. Right. I, I think it, I think the term listen is an unfortunate term because it seems to primarily refer to auditory and right. you end up with this dual use. Even Michelle is saying, listen, but you know, listen in a way that's different from listening in ASL to describe auditory listening. It's a, it's a conflation of different meanings in one term, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right. The actual definition is focused just on the auditory aspect and being able to receive information through your ear. So trying to pay attention to something that is auditory only. Or just you want to listen for a specific thing or you want to hear a specific thing like an alarm or you are auditorially paying attention to something. So again, that's the definition that we find in a lot of dictionaries, but it's not a very inclusionary definition. I, I agree. And I think that it's, uh, I, I say unfortunate because it may contribute to <clears throat> devaluing the experience of listening for somebody who doesn't have hearing as if it's less than listening with your ears, which I think is maybe that's an assumption on my part. A, a, a problem uh, culturally is to assume that people who are deaf and hard of hearing should or would want or are missing something by not hearing. Well, so I feel like the word itself is actually the least of our concern, <laughs> to be honest. So, I mean, absolutely, it's not a fully inclusive definition, of course, but I think that ASL actually makes it more inclusive. So like what I showed you before, how you would sign listening, you know, per the person. And so I think that sign includes a variety of different people. So again, you can show it either listening with your eyes or with your ears. So I think that's a one up that ASL has. However, you know, deaf people, well, I should say most people are either born deaf or they become deaf at a young age. So maybe around two or three years old. So with that being the case, they don't really necessarily feel that hearing is something that they've lost. So that's just their normal everyday life. You know, they don't know otherwise. Again, there are different perspectives. If you ask a, another deaf person, you know, if they miss something that they've, or like, for example, you might ask somebody, you know, do you miss this person, even though they've never met them? It's kind of that parallel that they don't know what they're missing. So I can't really say, oh, do you miss not being able to hear? You, you can't really ask that because if they never had the ability to hear in the first place, it doesn't necessarily even matter. That's just part of their life and that's fine. 
I think for hearing people, because they're born hearing, you know, they've always had the ability to hear. They can listen to music and talking and all of that. So they feel like, oh, that would just be a huge loss for me. I don't know what I would do if just suddenly one day I woke up and I was deaf and I didn't have access to these things anymore. That's just the mindset of hearing people. But, you know, for like I said, for most deaf people who are born deaf, that's just their normal life. And that's just how they function in their day to day. And the deaf community, I should say most people in the deaf community, they don't necessarily view it as a loss. We have the word that's called deaf gain. So again, it's just a different perspective. So instead of using the term loss, we talk about, you know, what we gain from, you know, being deaf. You know, we have our own community. We have a different culture that we're involved with. There are just a lot of different things that are actual benefits for us. Like, for example, if you're on an airplane, if you see a baby that's on the plane, you know, maybe the baby will be crying the entire time on the flight. So that's a really great example of deaf gain. We don't have to listen to that baby crying the entire flight. So we try to view it as a more positive experience rather than something that we have lost or it's something that's negative. Absolutely, we do have challenges that we face regularly, of course. And I own my label as a disabled person. I feel like, yes, I am disabled. And that's because, you know, within society, that's what they labeled me as. But I also feel like I have so many gains from my quote unquote disability. I'm feeling so warm towards you and really loving your answers. And you're launching from my question. Uh, just trying to start from one word, but really a nice, so much really interesting material about deaf gain. That's a concept that's a little new to me, I think. Yeah, I have plenty of books about deaf gain if you'd like to read. I have great reading lists you can have. <laughs> and there's a, the, I'm aware, I live in Rochester, so I'm, I think, somewhat aware that there's a strong deaf community that is its own culture and norms and I'm liking how you're helping clarify some of that. Yeah. Yeah, Rochester has a very large deaf community here. It's been said, I've heard it said around um, other marginalized populations that the marginalized population knows more about the dominant population than the dominant population knows about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's impossible for a deaf person to never meet a hearing person. That's absolutely impossible. But on the flip side, it's very possible that a hearing person will potentially never meet a deaf person in their life, like ever. So as a marginalized community, we have to often assimilate ourselves to, you know, the dominant culture and community and population. You know, as a marginalized community, again, we don't always have full access. We don't always have full support. Oftentimes we just have to fight for what we need and we try to advocate for ourselves and you know, we've been living this experience, you know, every day firsthand. And so, 
you know, in the dominant population, they don't necessarily always pay attention to what we need. And again, that's fine because that's not the life experience that they have, you know? They are living their own experiences, so they're paying attention to their own needs rather than ours. But again, they are a bigger population, so again, we normally do have to assimilate to the larger population. I'd love to hear more of some of the needs that you, I know where I, I know you're not speaking for everybody, but that, but you are, you are an educ. you have a master's degree in the science of uh, uh, language. So I think that maybe gives you a little more of a platform in some regard. Uh, so what are some of the needs that this, that uh, the dominant culture is less aware of? Or, or has suppressed. Okay, a really great example is access for anything that's on TV or things that come up on the news. Especially during any sort of big news announcement. If there's an emergency that occurs or something that needs to be announced, if there's some sort of you know big presentation or anything like that, or maybe it's something that's political, if there's some sort of you know political event that's happening. Sometimes you know other countries have set up an interpreter on the screen that's like picture in picture that has an interpreter normally at the bottom right hand corner of the screen, and they'll also have automatic captioning on. And so deaf people can read the captions. So that model provides access for people who would rather read the captions or for people who would rather watching the interpreter. So there's the two modes of access right there happening. Now, for the U.S., actually just recently in the 1990s, they are required to provide captioning on TVs. So, again, I was born in the 90s, so that's really new. So now, like I mentioned, it, prior to the 1990s, they weren't required to provide captioning. So if something, you know, crucial or important, like a hurricane was coming or you know, there was some sort of big news announcement about something important that was happening, some big event or something, oftentimes deaf people didn't have access to the information. And so they would need to learn from other people and what they were doing. So maybe they learned from a family member or a friend, you know? And so they never really had that direct access, which is not fair. You know, we need access too. Absolutely. I noticed that uh, between us, when I wanted to talk to you, uh, you t tell me a little bit about the service that you used so that we could communicate that um, I, I couldn't just pick up the phone and call you, if I remember correctly. Right. Yep. So I use a service that's called video relay service and so we just call it vrs so the company that i use the vrs company that i use is called convo they have a lot of interpreters and a lot of centers around and there are also many other vrs companies too not just convo so what happens is that i have an app that's downloaded on my phone they also have a website that you could use. You can sign up there. And then you have to be a deaf and hard of hearing person to use it. You can't be a hearing person and have access to this mobile app. It's an entirely free app, and that's because of the ADA. And that's, you know, about accessibility for, you know, for full telecommunication anytime, anywhere. 
There's actually a new law that was recently passed in the 90s. Well, like, again, I mentioned the ADA was recently passed. Um, So with VRS, as a hearing person, you want to call me. So it's a different phone number compared to your regular registered phone number for a mobile company. So what will happen is that I will see your call coming through and I will answer. And so a video will pop up for me and there will be an interpreter there on the screen. It looks kind of like a FaceTime call that you would have. And so it looks like I'm essentially FaceTiming with the interpreter. So I will sign and the interpreter will use their voice to communicate with you and we'll go back and forth that way. So for you as a hearing person, you know, it seems like you're using just a regular phone call. You're just speaking and you're just listening because again, and for me, I'm signing and watching. So it's a really nice service to use because now I'm able to make phone calls, you know, anytime I want. Now, prior to VRS being a service that was readily available, they had something that was called TTY. Do you, do you know what TTY is? I remember it. I remember the acronym, but I don't, it's long ago. I don't even remember, remember it that well. Yeah. So it's definitely an old communication, old technology. It was a huge device that would be, you know, really cluttered. It would be hard to have. So you would type and that would be connected to a phone. So the phone would start ringing. And then once you'd pick it up, the message would come through, you know, on a paper or on a screen, and then you would have to read the entire thing. And then once it was done coming through, I would type and respond back. So using TTY was a slow process, was not really a great system. I personally never had to use TTY. Luckily, you know, they had better technology that I grew up using. But, you know, a lot of older deaf people will actually still use their TTY because if they don't have a smartphone or access to internet or access to VRS, they can't use that service. Thank you. This brings me to another question, which I think is a little related to why... I wanted to have ASL on the show. The easiest way to uh, make this show accessible to the deaf and hard of hearing would be to use a captioning service or to hire someone to type it out. I had the idea that there's a difference between reading and signing. And since I'm looking for the nuances of listening on this podcast about listening, I wonder if you could share a little bit about, uh, well, I know it's true for me that reading is different than listening with my ears. So imagining, uh, tell us a little bit about how that is true or not true for you with signing versus reading. So again, ASL is its own language. So reading means that you have to switch to a brand new language. Oh my God. English and ASL are completely different languages. So with signing in ASL, you know, that could be somebody's main method of communication. That could be their primary language. So if you're providing a transcript or a captioning, That is great. Yep, that's an okay approach. Well, actually, you know what? Let me back up to explain. If you were to provide captioning, like for example, a TV show or something like that, if somebody's just watching a regular TV program, captions are just the norm, and that's fine. Just because you don't expect to have an interpreter on screen just for a regular TV show, you know, that would be incredibly distracting really for me personally. However, if for having this set up today, having the option of having an interpreter and 
having them use their voice and me signing compared with providing just a transcript only after, you know, the podcast was all, all said and done. I would much rather have, you know, the interpreter present. Again, having an interpreter means that I have full access and, you know, providing that option would be great. And it's kind of like telling a deaf person that, you know, every time you go to watch a TV show, uh, they can watch or they can instead read the script after, you yeah. know? <laughs> So it's that sort of concept. You know, we want access in real time. We want to be able to watch the show and understand simultaneously. And so going back to the first point about, you know, ASL being its own language, a lot of people prefer ASL as their first language just because they feel, you know, that's they're able to receive ASL you know, through their eyes, they're able to understand better. It's more natural for them. But sometimes, you know, for deaf people, reading can be a huge strain on their eyes. Mm. And so they don't prefer it. It's not their way of absorbing information as, you know, receiving ASL would be. Thank you. I'm going to ask what I hope is not a dumb question. Or... I don't think it's a dumb question. I'm going to go back and say no, I'm, but I'm interested. In, I'm curious. So uh, the language that I speak, I actually don't know the name of it. I think it's, I don't know if it's just called English or is this, uh, is there a formal name like American English because British speak English too. Do you know, is there a formal name for the language that I'm currently speaking Yeah, I would normally say American English. Just because, you know, Americans, the English that they speak is different compared to people in, like you mentioned, Britain. So when I watch the amazing British uh, television shows, uh, my wife and I put the captioning on because we, that really helps us to understand all the dialogue. So my, my language, American English, has two grammatically similar forms. It can be written and it can be spoken. You're telling me that ASL is a language in and of itself and it's signed. Is there a written form of ASL? Officially, no. A lot of people have attempted documenting ASL and placing it into a written form. A lot of people have tried to come up with different symbols to represent signs, or they tried to figure out how they can document it on paper. You know, for example, we have a lot of history, you know, there's a huge history in the deaf community and it's sort of impossible to document that. So a lot of it has been forgotten. You know, so like I mentioned, there's no official documentation or no written form of ASL, no, but there have been attempts. So we do label ASL American Sign Language just because that's only for Americans. Now there is a separate sign language for, there's a British sign language. So yes, people in Britain speak English, but they have their own form of sign language called the British Sign Language or BSL. And other countries have their own separate sign languages as well. ASL is not universal. Wow, that is, uh, I, I'm learning a lot. Yeah, I notice a lot of people are shocked when I tell them that ASL isn't universal. Like so many people think that it is. I'm not sure why, you know, that's the case, but that's what it has been. You explained to me in our call that people find themselves with or without hearing for various reasons throughout life. 
And as ASL is a language, language acquisition is done best during our early formative years. And so there's um, almost some biological barriers to becoming fluent in a language later in life. And then you need the time, money, and resources to invest in that. Right. Yeah, so the best time for language acquisition are ages zero to ages five. Your brain is the most malleable, so you're able to absorb much more in those ages. That doesn't mean that it's impossible to learn ASL later. You absolutely can. Or really any language you can acquire at any time. It's just harder past that critical time frame. It's just easier between ages zero to five that you're able to acquire a new language. Great. I, I studied French starting in eighth grade. Nice. Do you remember any of it? Oui. Yeah, that's yes in French. <laughs> So we've covered some of the questions. Uh, I think you covered adequately, but maybe not the idea that an ASL interpreted podcast for some people is going to uh, have a much different quality than reading a transcript. Even, but even post like a, the record, like, so once we're done recording, a, a person who doesn't hear has the option of can see this and that's going to be, uh, more enjoyable for some people to s listen to it rather than read it. Just like I don't want to read a transcript of a podcast, which I don't think I've ever done. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, I, I can't really add more to that. It's that simple, you know, having that preferred mode of communication. You know, to have that access, that's, I mean, nothing beats direct access like that. It's always best to have, you know, direct access to communication or live access. For me personally, I feel like I always feel a lot happier, a lot better when I know that there are other people that are thinking about, you know, making accommodations for me too you know, or that I'm not less than, or that I'm not just a second thought, but that it's something that you're actively thinking about and doing. I feel like if someone were to say, oh, I'm listening to this really cool podcast about deaf and hard of hearing people, and they just, just give the transcript of it because it's not accessible otherwise, the person's not necessarily going to want to read it especially as a deaf person, they're going to feel like, okay, why is this the only mode of accessibility? You know, for me reading a transcript, why don't I have the option to see sign language? Why can't I actually see the podcast? Because like I had mentioned before, we are such visual people. That's how we want to be able to access the information. Yes. I'm going to do a little, uh, that's what I thought. And I'm going to do a little, uh, turn a corner here. I learned a word when I was um, investigating uh, accessibility for this podcast. And the word is outist, which I think is spelled A-U-D-I-S-T. Right. Would you mind sharing what that is, what that means? And So the term is pronounced oddest, and essentially what it means is to feel that deaf and hard of hearing people are either less than or inferior, or you look down on us, or you feel like they can't do something just because they're deaf. even something that's not even related to a task that you need to hear, they still assume that they can't do it. You know, for example, 
I get asked all the time, can you drive? I mean, yes, I, I can definitely drive. I, I do drive. Actually, it's a little off point, but deaf and hard of hearing people are statistically better drivers compared to hearing people. So that kind of goes back to the point of we have better peripheral vision, which makes us better drivers. We have less car accidents compared to hearing people because we're able to see more and take in more. So yeah, that's a question that I get often. Can you, can you drive? Like, yeah, why wouldn't I be able to drive? I'm not blind. I can see, I can see just fine. And you know, I can hear the radio too. If I were to put my hand on the dash and turn the volume up, I could feel the vibrations from the songs. A lot of people also ask me, can you read? Um, you know, yes. <laughs> so again, they ask me things like, how do you learn? How'd you learn how to read? And so they're just, <sighs> it's just things that aren't related to my deafness I get asked about. And people just assume that we can't do it because we can't hear. So that's kind of more of the oddest mindset. I know it's not always intentional. Sometimes it can be completely, you know, misinformed. And it's just because of ignorance. You don't know. So again, trying to use those moments of inquisition as sort of teaching moments. Just try to clarify that, yeah, I, of course I can drive. You know, why wouldn't I be able to? And so that gives me the platform then to be able to explain more things about deaf culture. And it gives more people that exposure. You know, sometimes uh, oddest comments are on purpose. It's unfortunate. But a lot of people, even when they are exposed to the deaf community, they still believe that deaf people can't do things or that they are less than. And personally, I think that goes back to how people are being raised. If they don't have access to language, you know, language is the base of literally everything. If you don't have access to, a, or well, actually I should say full access to language, you're deprived, you know, you can't learn, you can't cognitively develop. So that's the official term for that is language deprivation. And that language deprivation can actually become an official uh, mental disability as well. And that's, you know, something that happens in the educational world. So going back to the term oddest and having an oddest mindset, it's... If you were to look at it, deaf people as less than, or if you feel that they are inferior or anything like that, that's what it would mean to be oddest. And it comes really down to that. But if you do take the time to learn and understand that yes, we do have challenges that we face regularly, you know, that doesn't mean that we're less than less than just because, you know, we can't hear. Well, that's intuitive to me. And yet it's always helpful to learn from the experience of another population and to listen to what people in that community have to say about their experience. Right. I, I think I have the hope that uh, this episode uh, might help with a awareness for hearing people and maybe be a small, teeny little tool to be anti autist Yeah, I hope so. Another, uh, I, I just want to mention that I don't think most people, you know, say these 
oddest things or believe these oddest things intentionally. It's just because they haven't been exposed to it yet or they don't know any better. Or again, it's just, you know, they've never met a deaf person before. So they just make these assumptions based on society or maybe they've had a little tiny bit of exposure during school. But again, it's learning about people with disabilities and that's more of like blanket statements that happen in that sort of conversation. So to actually learn about individual people and their experiences, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah, that's what I think the idea that ASL is a different language really kind of helped me recognize that we, uh, to really communicate the most deeply, uh, we need an interpreter. Absolutely. Yep. So tell me what, you know, I've, uh, every guest I've had, I've been curious about their experience with listening, how they um, just uh, I've interviewed musicians and psychologists. Uh, what does listening mean to you? Um, you're, you have a master's degree in education. Tell me about what you've learned or something you want to share about or a fantastic ex experience, like who was who 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 do you think was a great listener, uh, mentor in some way, or someone you've really appreciated listening to? Any sort of broad question there? Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Well, there's the risk of broad questions. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got to take a minute to think. Sorry. Well, it's the my, my job to ask a better question. <laughs> Who do you feel you've learned about listening from? Uh, is there a, a, a scholarly work, a, a writer, a person who you feel has uh, modeled or taught you some lessons about being a good listener, about listening? Yeah, I don't think there's any one person in particular that I can say that I learned it all from. I think it's just something that I've acquired by being exposed to different people. And I've taken a little bit from what I've learned from everybody and I've kind of made that my approach. And I feel like listening in different settings means a lot of different things. So for in the educational setting in the classroom, you know, listening means that I need to pay attention to the teacher if I'm coming from the student perspective, of course. Now I'm becoming a teacher, so I am I understand that listening means I need to pay attention to my students. You know, it's kind of the opposite of that. You know, as a teacher, that doesn't mean that I need to just actually listen to whatever they're saying, but I sometimes need to listen to what they're not saying. Like, for example, a lot of what I learned about you know, if I'm teaching something, I need to kind of observe the classroom to pick up on, you know, their body language to figure out whether or not they're understanding what I'm teaching. You know, maybe sometimes a student feels shy and they don't want to raise their hand to ask a question if they don't understand what's being taught. You know, that's my job. I need to sort of figure out my students' perspectives and maybe repeat what I just said. I need to learn how to, you know, work with all my students individually as best as I can. So that's a really great way for communication and how language helps me as a teacher because I'm able to kind of analyze their body language of, you know, of my students and just learn more about them with, you know, specific things I have to ask in order to access the information that they might not want to share themselves. You know, when I teach, I'll be working with younger populations and oftentimes they don't have the ability to express exactly what they need. That's not something that they developed quite yet. So I need to learn how I can try to listen to really what they're not saying or listen to things based on their behavior or their facial expressions, or if they're acting out, 
I need to figure out how to listen to that so I can work with them in a more efficient way. So whether or not you want to call that listening, that's just what happens in the classroom. But listening with friends or with family or in more casual and social settings rather than more formal and educational ones. For me, listening is actually, let me back up. I have something a little bit separate from that. For friend groups and more intimate groups like that, listening means just paying attention and being in the moment with them, you know, just conversing that way. For ASL, listening means having and maintaining eye contact with the other person. If you lose that eye contact, that's actually considered to be a little bit rude because that means that if you lose eye contact, you're not fully paying attention to that person and you're not fully engaged in that conversation if you were to look away. So just being there and being present and being taught to be a good active listener, I think that's really important of being a good friend. Now with family, my entire family is hearing. I'm the only deaf person. Obviously, I'm not hearing. My family doesn't sign. So I don't sign with them. So for when it comes to listening with my family, it's a lot of lip reading. It's a lot of trying to pay attention to a lot of different cues that are all happening simultaneously. And that's something I'm not used to doing. I'm not in the habit of you know trying to pick up on those cues regularly. So going back to, you know, listening with friends, I'm able to use ASL. If someone needs to get my attention in that friend group, they'll tap me on the shoulder or, you know, they'll pound on the table or they'll stomp their feet so I can feel the vibration or they'll flick the lights on and off to get my attention. You know, that's the deaf way of getting another person's attention. Now going back to hearing people like, or my family, you know, hearing people will normally, you know, call their name or scream or shout to get the other person's attention, right? That's not something I'm used to. I'm not in the habit of getting cues that way because I'm not listening for that. I'm not actively listening for auditory cues to get my attention. And so I kind of need to shift my mindset a little bit when I'm hanging around solely hearing people or, you know, people like my family, just because I'm not really oriented to that on a regular basis. I was actually just with my family for three weeks. I was visiting with them and catching up. And so it was great. You know, I love being around my family and seeing them because I don't get to see them all that often. But wow, I completely forgot how much work it is to be surrounded by just hearing people because I'm not used to it. You know, I'm not used to always having to look every which way in order to pick up on those cues. And so I have to pay a lot more active attention. You know, I feel like I'm listening from everywhere because I need to be able to pick up on so much more that's happening. You know, again, if I'm with my friends or here in this podcast where I have direct communication, I don't need to always, you know, be actively listening because they know that if they need me, they could just, you know, tap me on the shoulder and get my attention that way. My family doesn't always remember how to do that, how to get my attention. They do try, yes, but I need to be a lot more alert to what's going on. And I need to be paying closer attention because, you know, hearing people use different cues than I'm used to. I'm kind of overwhelmed with emotion there. The sense of sadness that you don't speak the same language as your family well, you speak it, but your primary language is a different language. Right. My first language actually is English. But my preferred language is ASL. It's so. more suited to it's more right. suited to a person who doesn't hear. Right. Yep. Yeah, my brother signs a little bit, and so I can lightly converse with him. It's just mostly just basic foundational signs, but but yeah. So I had this sense of sadness and uh, 
and then I had the sense that there's really two interpreters on this show right now. There's Nicole, who's interpreting the language, and then there's you, who's interpreting a culture in a way that I deeply appreciate your willingness to take the time to share that. Of course, absolutely, anytime. Again, and I don't want anyone to pity us as deaf people or to feel sad or any of that. That's not what we're going for here. <laughs> I, I, Sometimes, yes, it's not necessarily the best situation to be deaf because it's true that not all families learn ASL. Actually, most families don't learn ASL. And it's not fair. And it's not always the best situation because deaf kids want that access. They crave having that access. But that doesn't mean that, you know, I don't love my family. Of course I do. I still enjoy their company. I still enjoy being around them. And I just appreciate everything they've done for me too. So I still truly deeply appreciate my family regardless of that fact. Well, it's, uh, <clears throat> I hope it's not, uh, I know, I know that you're not looking for I, some kind of emotional sympathy. I think that when I, uh, was listening to you, I wanted to share the emotional experience that came up in me as you were talking. Um, I think of that as a kind of responsivity in listening to share what another's words, the impact another person's experience and words have. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks. You talked about how uh, disengaging eye contact is um, sometimes considered a sign of disrespect. And I thought about the way that I communicate and talk with people and listen. And sometimes they intentionally turn my head away or avert my gaze because it takes up a lot of cognitive brain power to read someone's facial expressions. And sometimes I want to kind of go inside a little bit. And uh, so maintaining eye contact and I'm trying, I'm, I'm, as we're talking, I'm, uh, trying to look at you. So there's my square is up on zoom with you right now. I'm trying to look at you. Uh, and I, it is to, to maintain eye contact with someone for this long is, uh, it is cognitively tiring. Yeah. Yeah. Some people, you know, if they were first exposed to it, if they've had that, you know, sort of culture shock, you might be like, why are you looking at me so much? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it can be a little bit awkward for hearing people for the first few times they're exposed. Just because, again, we want to maintain that eye contact. That's how we show respect. But hearing people are more, you know, focused on themselves and more reserved sometimes. And so they feel like, don't look at me so much. Stop. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So we're... Is there anything else you'd like to share? I, I think we should uh, sort of move towards a close. Is there anything you'd like to reflect on, share? Oh, boy. Um, hmm. Just, you know... Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity that you've given me today to sit down with you and have these discussions and to, you know, spread the awareness and to explore more, pe more people and to educate more people. And just thank you for that. I really loved this. And it really, it, it touched me that this is something that you wanted to do. So it makes me happy that you're actually interested with that and learning more about it. And, you know, I hope that for anybody who is interested or they want to learn more about the deaf community or maybe 
they have the opportunity to meet a deaf person or they want to meet a deaf person or really anything, don't be intimidated or don't feel like that, you know, you can't talk with us. We're not scary people, <laughs> you know? We're not mean. We are open-minded, open-hearted. We are absolutely willing to have these conversations. You know, most of us, we will try to find a way to be able to accommodate. Maybe we can write back and forth with you and communicate that way. We'll figure out a way if you are interested and willing. If hearing people are willing to try to accommodate us, we will accommodate them as well. We're willing to do the exact same thing. You know, it's all about the reciprocity and having mutual respect. You know, I hope that if anybody sees a deaf person or they meet a deaf person, you know, don't have that sense of pity, you know, don't apologize to them for being deaf and not being able to have the ability to hear. It's okay. You know, you don't have to apologize for it. Again, just try talking with us if you want to. And if you don't want to, then don't. If you have any questions about, you know, who we are, please come to the source, you know, come to us deaf and hard of hearing people. So then you're learning the right things and you're doing the right thing. Today, Dan, you did the right thing by talking to me because you wanted to know, you know, you want to know more about the deaf community. And that's really the best thing that you could do. You know, rather than making assumptions or saying that you learned it from, you know, my friend who was friends with this person and all that. So it's better if you come directly to the source. And again, we are more than willing to share with you our experiences and you know, we're willing to teach and to work with you so you can learn. And we want to learn about you as well, because I'm sure there's a lot of things that we don't notice that are happening in the hearing community and the hearing world, because we're just not part of that. I, I appreciate the compliment and I, I appreciate the um, offering that you're making uh, uh, seemingly on behalf of a number of people who are deaf and hard of hearing to be approachable. Uh, but I, I want to thank you uh, specifically, Michelle. I, I, you're not the first person I reached out to. And so your uh, willingness uh, was of particular note to me. And the experience I've had talking with you has been a combination of clarity, patience, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, um, uh, assuming the best in my intentions, and and so you you specifically I think have done a very nice job of. Uh, sharing with me yeah of course you know i'm sure you're gonna look back on this experience and we're both gonna be like oh i forgot to mention that or i forgot to ask that i'm sure that's gonna happen but what are you gonna do well in the best case scenario we do a second interview <laughs> there you go anytime thank you so much for coming on the show and I, I guess I also want to thank uh, Nicole for uh, interpreting. Thank you. Yep, no problem. And that concludes another episode from Season 2 of On Listening. Thank you for joining us. Please check out our webpage, onlistening.net, and subscribe. Please leave reviews on your favorite podcasting site. It helps me make a name for this. I don't have corporate sponsorship. And all my guests are providing their time free. So there's no way to advertise this program other than word of mouth and your ratings. Email me, comments or questions, dan at onlistening.net. Thank you so much for joining again. Take care. Mm -hmm.